A formerly derelict wing of the old nurse's home in King Street opposite the hospital, Wheeler House, has been transformed by a federal government grant into a delightful suite of offices. Following an official opening today by the member for Newcastle, Alan Morris, the area now houses the Centre for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics in the University's Faculty of Medicine. Several Hunter medical notables were invited for the opening of the centre, which according to Director Professor Richard Heller, provides postgraduate training for doctors from both overseas and local to bridge the gap between individual clinical medical practice and the wider study of public health. You need to understand things in a grand scale, for example, to understand what's the best treatment to use in an individual patient. You can't always get that from looking at one person's response. You need to look at large numbers. You need certain techniques that allow you to uh, carry out the right trials and uh, use the right methods. So what you're doing is teaching people the correct way to do that, is that right? That's right. And uh, we're concentrating on postgraduate uh, training of doctors who are already qualified, mostly already specialists in their own field. And we're giving this new emphasis, which we hope will contribute not only to their clinical work and make them better doctors, but will get them doing important research work into the health of the community. The Family and Community Services, or Fax Office, in King Street was due to close today, hence the mock funeral, but it's been given a two-week extension. Deeming the office to still be in its death throes, the organisers wanted the sombre gathering to go ahead as planned. Participants advised to wear masks to protect their identity. The Public Service Association says the government plans to close fax centres at Belmont, Singleton and Newcastle as part of a campaign to cut 3% off the department's expenses statewide. However, in the Hunter, it's claimed these cuts will be more in the region of 9%, the extra coming from cuts in funding to various community services. Um, child protection services will be affected, services to foster parents will be affected, services to the aged and disabled and ethnic communities will all be affected. The Public Service Association claims 44 positions will be lost in the Hunter. There aren't necessarily people in those jobs currently. Um, how many actual people will lose their jobs, uh, I'm unable to say. With the cuts in services and centres, it's feared only one fax office will be available to serve a population of 200,000 as families are coming under increasing stress. A backlash at the next state election is predicted. I think they should realise that the, some of the reasons Labor was defeated were exactly the reasons that they will be defeated if they continue along this path. Meanwhile, Family and Community Services Minister Virginia Chadwick says she is outraged at some of the misinformation being given to certain community groups. She says some foster parents have been told the services of regional psychologists are to be abandoned, when in fact she says there will be an increase of three in the Hunter. Twenty clubs from as far afield as Ballina and Sydney entered the two-day carnival, which has been conducted at Redhead for almost as long as inflatable rescue boats, or IRBs, have been part of the surf life-saving scene. The teams attempt to pick up a patient from around 500 metres out and return to the beach in as short a time as possible. IRBs have revolutionised surf lifesaving. With their superior speed and manoeuvrability, they've replaced the traditional surf boat as the principal rescue tool. These are the sort of conditions surf lifesavers dread. When the weather's hot, they can usually expect someone to ignore the warnings and get into difficulty in the surf. So, while most would have been cursing today, organisers of the carnival were only too happy. This is uh, the exact sort of situation you do have to do rescues in. And the reason we're continuing on with the carnival is because uh, this sort of situation hones the skills of all the drivers and the rescue teams. If anyone is to get into difficulties in the surf here today, there could be a few better places. After all, where else would you have around 100 fully qualified lifesavers ready and equipped to rush to your aid? And while their skills may have been honed, the two to three metre sets did claim some casualties, although fortunately only Pride was injured.
The reason for the crowds was the unofficial launch of Law Week. Newcastle Police Station held an open day to let curious visitors take a first-hand look at police work. It was the third annual open day, but crowds proved curiosity knows no bounds. Youngsters were fascinated by the lights and gadgets police use daily. A big favourite was the paddy wagon. Police also demonstrated alcohol testing units. Should you ever fail one of these and be charged, lock-up cells are only one floor up. Other displays included a roadside radar detector, a scientific investigation section complete with gruesome weapons, a fully computerized pistol range and radio operations. Meanwhile in Belmont, an open day of a different sort was held. The Hunter Water Board gave people the opportunity to visit a treatment plant to see what happens after the flush. Displays included the Hunter Fringe Area Sewerage Project and the upgrading of Burwood Beach Treatment Works. Carrington Slipways are building the ship and have begun contracting work out to local engineering companies. Today, two giant 35-ton engine housing compartments were moved from Islington to the slipway. The compartments are 8 metres high and are the tallest structures that will ever be able to be transported through Newcastle due to the layout of power lines and traffic signals. The two components were built in eight weeks, with crews working seven days a week and a full 24 hours yesterday. The engine modules and 15-ton rudder is Phelps Engineering's first venture into shipbuilding and represents a $300,000 contract for the company. The two modules will be welded on top of each other once inside the ship and will form a full four decks of the vessel. Dick French has been an international class cricket umpire for 13 years and was today's special guest of the Newcastle Rotary Club. The club is celebrating its 65th anniversary in Newcastle this week at the Tattersalls Club, just across the road from where they held their very first meeting in the George Hotel in 1923. 30 members from the Sydney Rotary Club caught the train up to Newcastle today to join in the celebrations and listen to after dinner speaker Dick French. The now retired Mr French says he has some great memories from cricket. Uh, I think uh, last year when Viv Richards got his 100th century on the Sydney Cricket Ground, that was a great uh, memorable uh, uh, memory for myself. But I think uh, when Rodney Hogg bowled Jeff Boycott out in Melbourne for one, way back in 1978, this was at the height of the Packer split, and he bowled him for one and the crowd, there were about 60,000 there, the way they erupted it was noisier than a grand final. It's a magnificent memory. Mr French believes this Australian side is probably one of the best sides ever that has set out to win the Ashes. I think it'll be very close and, uh, and very well played. It'll be played in good spirit and I think the Australian boys will do particularly well over there. Certainly uh, maybe some of the English press are writing them off already but uh, they'll be in there right up to death. I think they'll win the series. Taking and a great result, costing tens of millions. Uh, New South Wales. Total program that I announced uh, to operate from the 1st of January this year will.
Cessnock is now one of 13 towns in New South Wales on the shortlist for the maximum security prison. And after months of waiting, a spokesman for Mr Yabsley this week revealed it's highly likely the final decision will be made by State Cabinet next week. And with that decision now so close, the wine growers of the Cessnock region have decided to make their opposition to the development clear. They've produced a study which concluded a maximum security prison in the area would cause mammoth problems for the region's fledgling tourism industry. Approximately $800 million worth of development is planned for the region. They also claim the prison, for the most part, has little support in the Cessnock community as well as the City Council. But this week, an angry spokesman for Mr Yabsley hit back at the Vigneron stand, labelling them as selfish and snobbish. He said the wine growers simply had their own little piece of heaven and that they didn't want to share it with anyone. He said their objections were only a minor consideration in the final decision and simply that they had been received and noted. On being told of that outburst, Barry Shields, secretary of the Hunter Valley Vineyard Association, said the spokesman was talking rubbish and that the very fact that the wine growers wanted to develop the tourism industry proved they were more than willing to share what they had. Mr Shields said such an outburst probably signalled that Cessnock was one of the most likely candidates but vowed if Cabinet did decide to situate the prison there, then the vignerons would continue their fight to have it reversed. The May Day conference was wide-ranging with talks on the economy, taxation and ACTU policy, but none put forward such a radical proposal as Mr Maitland, who urged unions to beat multinational companies at their own game. He said Australian companies were losing their national identity in a welter of takeovers and mergers, but unions could take a leaf from the multinationals' book. We've got to become more active internationally. We've got to have uh, more cooperation with uh, the uh, workers in countries where these very same companies operate. And uh, for example, the, uh, the coal industry in Australia uh, has to have more contact with uh, coal mine workers in the United States and coal mine workers in South Africa because uh, both of those countries have the very same uh, companies as uh, operate in Australia. Shell, BP, BHP, Utah, uh, Mobil, you know, when I mean, you just go the, the list is uh, almost endless. One barrier to Mr Maitland's objective was the taint of racism, which he said affected not only business dealings with Asia, but also trade union attitudes. The message quite clearly to, uh, to unionists in Australia is that we ought to have as much contact with uh, workers in those countries. After all, those workers are being exploited uh, probably more than ex workers in Australia. Um, and they're being exploited by the very same companies that operate in Australia. The Aurora Australis is due to be handed over to the owner P&O in December. 
It'll then be chartered to the government's Antarctic division and be based in Hobart. While the Aurora Australis is called an icebreaker, that more describes her capabilities rather than her purpose. The vessel will transport supplies and personnel to and from Australia's Antarctic territories. During the off-season, winter, she'll be used as a research vessel on fishing, oceanography, meteorology and environmental monitoring. Within her 95 metre length and 20 metre breadth, the Aurora Australis will accommodate up to 130 personnel for three months at a time, along with fuel enough for 14,000 nautical miles. And she'll be strong. Extra thick steel plating and closer ribbing are testimony to that. So she'll also be heavy. This cast steel bush itself weighs 34 tonnes, and her all-up weight will be nearly four and a half kilotons. But there is another important difference with this vessel, and that's the one which gives the Aurora Australis her ice-breaking capability. It's the bow. Not bulbous and not sharp and slicing, but S-shaped, so that it rides up onto the ice and then uses its enormous weight and 10 megawatts of diesel power to crack through and then proceed on her way. The Aurora Australis program itself is proceeding apace, with more than just the practical building project in mind. Carrington Slipways is confident of building the Anzac frigates and isn't wasting a moment preparing for that. Well, we're using this, uh, this ship, which is a complicated design, which is almost as complicated as a frigate. We're using it to introduce systems which uh, the Navy would require us to use uh, on their ships. And uh, they are working well, but uh, systems that you would not normally use on a commercial ship. But uh, we're using it so that we have a nice smooth transition to the frigate project. After years in the planning and raging controversy on whether it should be a high or low level structure, it's finally built. A duplicate bridge now spans the Swansea Channel. It will carry southbound traffic on the Pacific Highway. The old bridge will be used by traffic travelling north. The low level bridge and its approaches cost $12 million. The federal government paid for the construction under its Bicentennial Roads program, while the state government provided funds for the approaches. Both federal and state ministers will play a part in the official opening at 11am on Sunday, May the 21st. Peter Morris, the Federal Industrial Relations Minister, will be there, and Bruce Webster, the State Administrative Services Minister, will represent the Transport Minister, Bruce Baird. The Swansea Chamber of Commerce is planning a gala day to mark the completion of the second bridge. Traffic will begin using it from the next morning. Von Rietzgoten and Howans is one of the oldest and most widely respected electrical and electronic engineering and systems designers in the world. Set up in 1860, the company now employs around 3,000 people in its Rotterdam headquarters and in offices across the world. R&H, as it is commonly known, specialises in producing complete electrical systems for civil and military use and has had a long involvement with the Royal Netherlands Navy. The company is playing a very large part in the production of the new Dutch M-Class frigate, the vessel being tendered for the Anzac ship program by the AWS consortium. And that is what has brought it to Bullaroo, Lake Macquarie. To meet the federal government's requirement of at least 70% Australian New Zealand content in the contract, R&H had to look for a local base. HCB is a company very much like uh, R&H. They talk the same language, they're in the same business, they're extremely um, good and well experienced to people. HCB has been a part of the business life of Bullaroo since it was set up in 1948 by three young men as HCB Electrical. 22 years ago the company worked on its first marine vessel for Carrington Slipways and HCB Marine was born. For the past two decades HCB Marine has done all of the electrical installation on vessels built at Carrington's, most recently manufacturing and installing the control stations and switching gear on the Antarctic research vessel. It now has a turnover of three million a year and employs up to 120 people. We intend to um, <coughs> transfer the uh, project management of the installation part of the business immediately to HCB. As a matter of fact, uh, next week a manager of HCB will uh, go to Holland to get a, a quick course in uh, how do we how we do this uh, this work and on a 
longer time scale we'll transfer technology to build uh, boards and panels, things that uh, they already make here. The technology transfer we're going to gain from R&H is going to be fantastic for our younger people and also for Newcastle and give us a good base in this part of the area for the next 25 years we hope. The slogan which AWS carries is confidence from strength and I believe this is an example and a good example of it. Employees at RZM Mines on the Pacific Highway noticed the gas leaking from one of five cylinders this morning. Fire brigades from Newcastle, Taro and Raymond Terrace were called around 2.30 and the plant was evacuated. When the petroleum gas contacted the air it froze, jamming the safety valve open. Fire brigade officers attempted to melt the frozen gas by spraying it with water and at one stage it looked like they'd succeeded. However, the valve burst a short time later and the officers were forced to wait for the arrival of L-gas. They will try and attempt to uh, fix that valve first and then failing that they'll have to drain the tank and uh, um, we'll just have to see. There's no immediate danger to any uh, person or property, the highway is still open. The cylinder was filled at 8.30 this morning. A brigade spokesman says the leak may have been due to a faulty valve or too much gas in the cylinder. The game never reached any great heights with both defences right on top from the word go. The Falcons managed to lead by one point at quarter time and by six points at the long break. But then in the crucial third quarter, Eastside Melbourne Spectres hit their straps through Kent Lockhart who sunk a couple of great three-point bombs and the visitors were right back in the match. The lead seesawed in the final term and then the Spectres hit trouble. Within two minutes and still five minutes remaining in the match, Dean Newtoff and Ben Tower were both fouled out and the Falcons had the opportunity of sewing up the game. However, the replacements for the Spectres lifted their games and the Falcons made an ordinary attempt to win the match, which should have been theirs. To the Spectres' credit, they never gave up and deserved their win. For the locals, it's a disappointing start to the season. They are without a win after four matches. Four tonnes of sand have been dropped in the Civic Playhouse to create a seaside resort on the Scottish East Coast. The play revolves around the character Fiona, who as a 32-year-old looks back at her adolescence, how her values have changed and how she reacted to growing up. You told me there was no Santa Claus. I was sucking a gobstopper. I just started it. I swallowed it whole. It yo-yoed up and down inside me for days. Because as soon as you said it, I knew it was true. There's no Santa Claus. Well, so what? A waste of a good gobstopper. <laughs> like most 15-year-olds, Fiona was determined to have things her way and go to any extremes to seek attention. As an adolescent, she becomes pregnant. And I think it, it was a plan that was going to help her life, which turned out to make a real mess of it, in fact. And I think growing up and living with that, like living with, say, having murdered somebody or living with something, it's something that is on her mind, perhaps, uh, and made her tough, I think, made her a little hard. A boisterous look into a young woman's emotions, when I was a girl I used to scream and shout, begins a three-week season this Wednesday.